A and B. Right. Um, now, the question is of when did the variety of chlorophylls appear? Certainly, the large variety of chlorophylls appeared first in the origin of the photosynthetic process itself in photosensitive bacteria of various kinds. And there was a great diversification in chlorophyll type in photosynthetic bacteria, leading to many different groups of photosynthetic bacteria. In fact, they are still being discovered today. Very recently, a new kind of photosynthetic bacterial chlorophyll, that is bacterial chlorophyll G, was discovered, for example. So that variety occurred probably in the lower Archean, that is, chlorophyll synthesis itself in organisms in the lower Archean. However, there have been, there were some changes, that is, the appearance of chlorophyll B, not bacterial chlorophyll B, but chlorophyll B, a chlorophyll characteristic of green algae and plants and some other miscellaneous protists, that kind of chlorophyll probably didn't occur to the late Proterozoic, so that we had an evolution of chlorophyll, but most of it is pre Phanerozoic evolution. So what happens during the photosynthetic process is that organisms in their metabolic processes and pathways during photosynthesis, they preferentially incorporate carbon-12 over carbon-13. And when that, the carbon that is fixed then becomes incorporated into, into the tissues of the plants, it has a lower carbon-13 to 12 ratio than the carbon dioxide that was coming in to the plant originally. What is the evidence that the oldest carbon on Earth was produced by a photosynthetic process? Well, when we look at the uh, delta C13 values of organic matter from some of the uh, oldest uh, carbonaceous cherts on the Earth, we find that there is a, there's a negative fractionation of carbon-13 on the order of 20 to 30 parts per mil. What that implies, then, is that there was an ongoing process, presumably biologically controlled, that caused the fractionation of that carbon-13. It caused a reduction in the uh, amount of carbon-13 that was incorporated into that, uh, that carbon. In other words, the carbon that we find in the carrageen fraction is not in equilibrium with, it's not in chemical equilibrium with the presumed ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-13 that, that occurred in the atmosphere at that time. Okay, pe people speak very loosely about the evolution of molecular systems, and we really want to distinguish clearly f between the evolution of macromolecules, DNA, messenger RNAs, transfer RNAs, various kinds of proteins, and other large molecules. That is, the evolution of those molecules within populations of organisms at a certain time and a certain place on the surface of the Earth, and prebiotic chemistry. I think that uh, the language doesn't allow everybody to distinguish this clearly, but I think that we all should do this. Do molecules by themselves evolve? That is an assumption made by Cyril Panamparuma and by uh, Clifford Matthews and other people who talk about prebiotic chemical evolution. What they are talking about are chemical changes, the complexification or the becoming more complex of molecules that somehow have a source of incoming energy that provides enough energy for the molecules to chemically change. And they sometimes call that molecular evolution. Um, biologists, on the other hand, are talking about the evolution of metabolic systems within organisms when they talk about molecular evolution. When they say the evolution of cytochrome C, they're talking about cytochrome C as a product of genes that produce messenger RNA, that produce cytochrome C in organisms, populations of organisms that live in communities at specific times and specific places on the sur surface of the Earth. Although people speak about prebiotic molecules evolving, I think that's very loose terminology. What they're studying are chemical changes at the expense of energy, chemical changes that give one some idea about how life started on the Earth. I wouldn't call that molecular evolution nor do molecules in organisms by themselves ever evolve. That is, the molecules don't evolve independently of the organisms. The molecules in evolve as a part of the evolving populations of organisms in which they are found. Therefore, I think the word and the concept and the phrase molecular evolution 
is not a very good one unless it's very clear what you're talking about. One wants to distinguish molecular evolution, which is the change in the structure and sequence of macromolecules inside cells, inside populations of organisms at specific times and places. One wants to distinguish that molecular evolution from chemical evolution, which is the term used for processes occurring outside of organisms and presumably before there were any organisms. In other words, chemical evolution is a prebiotic process. Molecular evolution is a biotic or an evolution, the manifestation of an evolutionary process in organisms. Really, the protobiont stage refers to a pre-life stage of organization and the attainment of a certain level of organization. This is all during the operin haldane sequence or hypothesis for the origin of life. So the protobiont stage really refers to a non-living uh, segment or, or part of the sequence of that, uh, of that hypothesized evolutionary sequence. The heterotrophic stage presumably refers to the first living stage. Uh, it's the stage that is derived from this hypothetical protobiont, and it really refers to the notion that there's uh, an organism, the organisms, the heterotrophs, are deriving their energy source and their carbon source from, from small molecular weight carbon-containing compounds that are, just happen to be in the environment, that they absorb those compounds and, and they, uh, they assimilate them into their metabolism. Uh, in, in some way. And then the notion is that photosynthesis was derived at some later state, so that photosynthetic organisms were presumably derived from some early um, heterotrophic type organism. As far as we know, there are, there are two mechanisms for the production of ozone. One would be photolytic dissociation of water in the upper atmosphere, and the second is the production of photosynthetic oxygen, in other words, oxygen as a gaseous byproduct of uh, photosynthesis. Uh, most people, I think, today would, would concede that it appears that most of the ozone is, well, ozone is a secondary, secondarily derived from reactions in the upper atmosphere involving O2, which then go to form O3. So uh, ozone is derived from the uh, O2 and that O2 is ultimately, at least the majority of it, is derived from photosynthesis, in other words, from organisms. Did the first photosynthetic organisms to evolve contribute to the formation of the ozone layer? I think they certainly did in the sense that any oxygen, any O2 that was getting into the upper atmosphere was then free to react to form ozone. One of the problems is that in, in terms of the chemical properties of the surface of the Earth at that time when the first photosynthetic organisms began to produce oxygen were very reducing. The conditions of the surface of the Earth were probably reducing so that any oxygen that was, any oxygen that was produced by photosynthetic organisms would have been used up very rapidly in terms of oxidizing soil regolith and, and surface materials. So that the actual escape of O2 into the upper atmosphere may have been at a slower rate or less, lesser amount than exists today. But it certainly, it's almost certainly contributed uh, some fraction to the production of ozone in the upper atmosphere. What is the explanation for the so-called su sudden explosion of animals at the um, end of the Precambrian or the beginning of the Cambrian? It is a question that Al Fisher called the most vexing question in paleontology. And I believe Elsa Barkhorn's answer would be different from my answer, will be different from Andy Knoll's answer, which I suggest you listen to on another tape, and Paul Strother's answer, which I think you should listen to on another tape, too. I don't think anyone understands fully the um, why at um, the very beginning of the, of the Cambrian there are many highly skeletalized uh, animals of, of, of various, from various phyla. But I suspect that one of the major aspects of this appearance of skeletalized forms in the fossil record has to do with the enormous increase in preservability 